Good evening. I want to give you a brief introduction into a small part of the extraordinary technology developments that took place in World War II. I'm going to talk about the air-to-surface vessel radar carried on aircraft of RAF Coastal Command and the Royal Navy Fleet Air Arm, which played a vital role in hunting the U-boats during the Battle of the Atlantic. So let's make sure we have some common ground to, to get started. So what is radar? Radar locates distant objects using radio waves. A short pulse of RF energy, say a microsecond in duration, is transmitted through a directional antenna and reflected back to the radar receiver from objects in its path. Range is measured by the time taken for the pulse to travel to an object and, and back again. If the radar transmitter has a narrow beam that scans in azimuth, then the bearing of the target can be deduced from the pointing direction of the antenna when it is detected. The term radar was first used in the United States in 1940. In the UK, early systems were known as RDF, radio direction finding, and airborne maritime systems were called ASV, air to surface vessel, and fighter radars were known as AI air intercept. At the start of World War II, radar systems were being developed in the United Kingdom, the United States, uh, France, uh, Japan and Germany. But uh, the UK chain home early warning system was the first operational military radar in the world. So this is a chain home system in Sussex. There are three transmitter towers here which would have had a, a big wire uh, antenna array strung up between them and four receiver uh, towers, uh, as shown here. This system entered service first in 1938, but you can see from the size of it that, that the technology was certainly not suitable for, for airborne use. So I'm going to be talking about air-to-surface vessel, and, and as I say, installed on maritime reconnaissance aircraft of, of the Royal Air Force and the Fleet Air Arm. And it was used for, for locating surface shipping for convoy protection, detecting coastlines for navigation, for U-boat hunting, which we're going to talk about mainly here, but also it was used for anti-shipping strike aircraft and search and rescue. Now the U-boats were actually submersibles and had to travel mainly on the surface using diesel engines. When submerged, running on battery power, speed was reduced, but they were less easily detected, especially from the air. However, they had to surface daily to recharge their batteries when they were vulnerable to detection from the air, even in low visibility and at night. And these ASV systems played a big part in detecting and homing onto surface U-boats in order to attack them with, with depth charges or later in World War II with, with homing torpedoes. Very late in World War II, the Germans developed the Schnorkel breathing tube that allowed them to run their diesel engines underwater and charge their batteries while submerged. These snorkel were very difficult to detect by radar, but uh, they came too late to, to affect the outcome of the battle. So chain home had a very long wavelength and, and shorter wavelengths, higher frequencies, which implies smaller antennas, were needed for airborne equipment. The world's first airborne radar, which flew in an Avro Anson Mark I, fitted with RDF-2 uh, in August 1937. And this was developed by the team at Bordsy Manor, led by Taffy Bowen. This radar operated at a frequency of about 240 megahertz and used an EMI television receiver as the first IF strip. On its first flight, this radar detected aircraft and ships. Immediately after war broke out, the German U-boat fleet was deployed, beginning hostile activities on the 3rd of September 1939 with the sinking of the passenger liner Athenia. At that time, uh, UK had no ASV radar. Experimental work on the Anson had shown what was possible, uh, but priority had been given to AI and, and ground-based air defence radars. Nevertheless, building on the experience of RDF-2, a design for ASV was agreed by November 1939, and PI and ECHO companies were, were contracted for 200 sets. And by December 1940, 24 Hudson aircraft and 25 Sunderlands 
they've been fitted out with this essentially experimental equipment with very little test gear or support and actually pretty unreliable. It used simple forward-looking dipole antennas for transmit and receive. I'll show you a picture of these in a minute, but direction finding was achieved by switching between the left and right receive antennas pointing forward of the aircraft and observing relative amplitudes displayed on an L-scope. So here is the layout of the um, ASV Mark I antennas on a Hudson and on a Sunderland. And we can see here on the Sunderland, the, the transmitter uh, dipoles on the nose of the aircraft pointing a beam forward. And then on the, on the left and, and right, uh, the, re the receive antennas and the receiver rapidly switch between these two antennas to determine the relative amplitude of, of the returns relative to the, the, the straight ahead position on the aircraft. And here is a, a nice picture of a, of a Mark I Sunderland uh, fitted with, with ASV Mark I. And you can see here the, the transmitter aerial on the side of, of, of the nose of the aircraft. So this is a typical ASV Mark I display. It, it used a cathode ray tube with a green phosphor with, with just a four inch uh, diameter. Range is, is shown as, as displacement up the screen here uh, and uh, Returns uh, at a given range are displayed as displacements, uh, lines to the left and right of the display. We can see here receiver noise. This is the, the sea echoes from the rough sea. But here is a target. That is a, a target which is uh, to the right of the, of the aircraft with a, a larger amplitude on that side and at a range, uh, depending on which range scale they're on, about between three and five miles. The radar operator would instruct the pilot to turn until the display showed equal amplitude returns to the left and right, indicating that the target was dead ahead. So here's an example of the technology of the time. Here is the cathode ray tube. And, and down here you can see a Pi television receiver, or the vision receiver from a Pi TV, which was used as, as the, the, the first intermediate frequency amplifier. And this has the famous EF50 valves, which were, were rescued uh, from um, Philips factory in the Netherlands just before the Germans invaded. So the lessons learned from the, the quite primitive ASV Mark I were taken into account in designing a better engineered version, which they called ASV Mark II. Engineering design principles that we now take for granted, such as standard size boxes and standard interfaces, were specified for the first time. And frequency was changed to prevent interference with Navy rotating beacons, an early example of spectral congestion. Pi and Echo were again contracted to produce equipment. And by March 1941, 2,000 transmitters and 1,000 receivers and indicators units had been delivered. 43 aircraft had been fitted with the standard ASV using these small dipole uh, antennas for transmit and receive, but these didn't really give good enough performance and uh, a long range version, which I shall show you in a minute, had, had started to be installed on, on 35 uh, aircraft by that time. By the end of the war, tens of thousands of these sets had been made. Uh, in particular, they were copied in the United States, uh, they were called ASE and SCR521. And indeed, the first airborne radar in the United States was ASV Mark II on a Catalina. Uh, and this was taken over as part of the Tizard mission in September 1940. The detection range against a surface U-boat with the simple ASV was about five miles. And for the long range ASV, this increased up to about 12 miles. So here is a picture of ASV Mark II showing the, the high gain antennas that I mentioned, the long range ASV. And, and what we can see here is a Lockheed Hudson. And instead, instead of a simple dipole transmitter on the nose, there's this Yagi array. And similarly on, on under each wing, uh, looking left and right, are, are these Yagi receive antennas. And these uh, Yagis gave a narrower beam and a more concentrated beam and, and, and longer detection ranges than the simple dipoles. They also introduced uh, long range side looking antennas. And this is the installation on, on a Wellington. 
And so uh, along the, the top of the fuselage here, there is a, is a, a 15 foot long transmitter array sending out beams to the left and right of the aircraft. And on either side of the aircraft were receiver rays, shown in more detail on the right here. And this allowed the aircraft to do a sweep search, looking either side of, of the aircraft as it flew along. Um, when it detected a target of interest, it would, it would turn and then home using the homing antennas shown here, again, with, with these Yagi arrays. Then this is an example of what the technology had already evolved into, a much better engineered bit of kit. This is a, a receiver from, from the ASV Mark II. This was built by uh, Echo. This is the, the, the tuning control. And you can see here the, the EF50s, uh, characteristic uh, red uh, cases, again, using the, the design derived from the Pi television. And this is the electric motorized switch, which was used to switch between the left and right receive antennas and the left and right display inputs on the, uh, on the cathode ray tube. So by 1942, Coastal Command were having, starting to have significant success against U-boats using ASV Mark II. And also with the Lee Light, which I shall mention later. However, in August 1942, the Germans introduced a very successful countermeasure to the metric ASV radars in the form of a warning receiver known as METOX. This was a simple receiver with a frame aerial that could be mounted on the conning tower of the U-boat when surfaced. Uh, and here's a picture of, of the antenna called the Biscay Cross. And this receiver allowed the submarine to, to detect the emissions from, from the ASV Mark II at long ranges and dive uh, before the aircraft could attack. A report dated April 1943 entitled Disappearing Contacts with, with Mark II ASV and marked most secret, reported that submarines detected at typically seven to 12 miles were mysteriously disappearing before an attack could be made. And this uh, countermeasure effectively put an end to ASV Mark II uh, as an effective way of, of, of hunting U-boats. Luckily, a technical solution to the METOX countermeasure was already under development. This was the magnetron, which allowed high pulses of microwave energy to be generated. Microwaves would uh, from henceforth play a key role in, in radar development. They could not so easily be detected by the German technology of the time, and they allowed much smaller antennas to be used in aircraft. So staff at GEC Wembley uh, Laboratories first heard about Randall and Boots uh, uh, magnetron in April 1940. This magnetron uh, was, was a laboratory device which yielded only low power when operated continuously. And it was located in the magnetic field of a laboratory electromagnet, producing a steady field. The Wembley staff introduced developments which produced a high power pulse sealed valve using a permanent magnet with a new type of cathode suitable for operational use. The prototype of this design was tested on 29th of June, 1940. Others were quickly produced in the laboratories and one of the early GEC magnetrons was flown to the United States and demonstrated there by members of the Tizard mission in September 1940. This is an example of a GEC high power six kilowatt magnetron from 1942, slightly later. Here is the magnetron itself um, with the cavity uh, inside here, these sort of cooling fins. And this is a large permanent magnet, which was a feature of these early transmitters. Giving the, uh, the technology to, to the Americans was absolutely essential at this time because we didn't have the capacity to, to manufacture these devices in, in the quantities required. The magnetron was first employed to develop a bombing aid in the form of, uh, of the radar H2S fitted to Lancasters and other aircraft of RAF Bomber Command. And this entered service uh, during 1942. And a typical installation is shown here. The indicator here used a cathode ray, six inch cathode ray tube with a plan position indicator display, which I shall explain in a minute. And this is the switch unit with all the, all the controls. With the advent of METOX, it was decided to, to adapt H2S Mark II as ASV Mark III 
operating in, in S-band, uh, uh, 3 gigahertz frequency, and the first microwave ASVs entered service in March 1943. So the use of microwaves meant that a small antenna could produce a, a narrow beam in azimuth. Uh, and, and this beam was then rotated continuously over 360 degrees at about 60 RPM, with the magnetron sending out pulses every one and a half milliseconds or so. So here is, is the aircraft, um, with, and this is the, the beam illu uh, illuminating the ground below it, and this is rotating rapidly uh, uh, through 360 degrees. And then the results were, were displayed on this plan position indicator, which shows uh, range and, and bearing in a plan view, and uh, this is shows a, a, an example over the sea. We can see some targets. This is a, a range marker, and this is some land. And here is an example of, a, of an actual um, uh, microwave ASV radar uh, PPI display. Uh, this is land, and this is a ship here, just on, on the edge of the display. And this large return in here is uh, an example of the, the sea return. This is the backscatter from the rough surface of the sea reflecting the, the radar signals. And this, you can see here in, in rough weather, caused considerable interference with, with the radar operation at short ranges. The rougher the sea, the, the more uh, clutter was visible. And this required a lot of skill by the radar operator to manipulate the gain and the and the brilliance of the display to detect targets as they moved into the clutter. This is an example of the, the scanner from, from the first um, microwave ASV, scanner type 51. This is a parabolic reflector. This is a, a, a horn microwave horn feed fed by coaxial cable here. And the, the feed, the, the, the horn and the reflector were, were, were rotated by this motor uh, uh, and rotated continuously over 360 degrees. And here is an example of ASV Mark III, a Lee Light Wellington, as it left the factory at Brooklands. The radar is installed on the nose of the aircraft here. You can also see just down here, actually stowed for, for landing, the Lee Light. This was a, a carbon arc searchlight and used to illuminate U-boats at night in the last phases of an engagement. The wartime sensor has, has obliterated the background in this picture. So this plot shows the numbers of U-boats sunk by land-based maritime aircraft flown by the UK and the United States. Many more were sunk also by surface ships and carrier-based aircraft. And we can see that the, the, the gradual build-up of effectiveness of these systems from the very early days in 1941, uh, with the, the increase in, in, in performance during 1942 with the, the Lee Light and ASV Mark II, uh, but with the advent of the Metox warning receiver, uh, the advent of AS Mark III, and these very long-range aircraft, uh, which I shall show you a picture of in, in a bit. In, in the early days, in 1941-1942, the, the battle was mainly uh, fought in the Bay of Biscay, uh, which was in range of, of the land-based uh, aircraft from, from the United Kingdom. And this forced the, uh, the U-boats uh, further out into the Atlantic, out of reach of, of, of our aircraft. But uh, with the advent of, of the long-range aircraft, particularly the very long-range Liberators, fitted with American ASV Mark X radar and APS-15, were able to prosecute the U-boats over the complete stretch of the Atlantic, which was very important. And you can see that the the U-boat losses started to increase very dramatically. Over 115 during 1943 were sunk just by maritime aircraft. And even with the advent of the Schnorkel, uh, the, the losses uh, continued at a very high level for the rest of the war. This, this plot shows that the total merchant shipping losses and, and the U-boat losses from all causes uh, over the duration of the, of the war. And you can see here the, the merchant uh, sh shipping losses rising to a huge level uh, during 1942, with 467 sunk over a four-month period. And we came very close to losing the Battle of the Atlantic at that stage. But then with the advent of uh, 10 centimeter ASV and the, and the very long-range aircraft, uh, merchant shipping losses started to, to reduce dramatically. 
but also uh, U-boat losses started to increase. And, and uh, during this uh, one four month period in 1943, almost 150 U-boats were sunk. And here are some of the Coastal Command long range aircraft uh, which were in service at the end of World War II and fitted with ASV Mark III. You can see the ha handy page Halifax, the Wellington, the Sunderland, the Vickers Warwicks were starting to come in with ASV Mark VI, and the Lockheed Hudson with ASV Mark II was still in service. The, the RAF also flew the, the Supermarine Sea Otter, uh, mainly for, for search and rescue operations. And then the fleet air arm were flying aircraft from, from carriers. And in particular for, for anti-submarine warfare operations, they were flying the, the fairy swordfish, here, here fitted with, with uh, ASV Mark 11, uh, an X-band uh, microwave radar fitted up the struts of the undercarriage here. And the fairy barracudas uh, fitted with ASV Mark II, and then later, particularly for submarine hunting, the, the uh, the Barracuda Mark III with ASV Mark XI. Also very important were the, the American aircraft made available to, to Coastal Command through the Lend-Lease program. And we can see here a B-17 Fortress fitted with ASV Mark II. You can see the, the side looking arrays and, and then the, 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 the forward looking uh, uh, homing arrays. Catalinas were flown with ASV Mark II and, and with microwave radars. And then at the bottom is shown the Consolidated Liberator, the GR Mark VI. This is the very long range Liberator, um, which played such an important role. The Germans also had ASV. And, and here is a picture of uh, uh, the Funkgerät uh, 200 Hörntweil uh, radar fitted on a Junkers 188. And this used a very similar operating method to, to ASV Mark II. It had a fixed uh, a forward looking transmit antenna and then left and right looking receive antennas with rapid switching between left and right to determine uh, direction. And uh, this is shown here fitted on, on a, a Junkers 188. And the eagle eyed amongst you might notice that this particular Junkers 188 has an RAF roundel. And this picture was actually taken at RAF Bryce Norton uh, in 1945, where, where various captured German aircraft were taken for evaluation at the end of the war. And, and here is a, a, an installation on a, on a Heinkel um, uh, torpedo bomber. And, and this is a slightly earlier German radar, but operating on the same principle, but at a lower frequency. Uh, showing the Rostock radar on a Focke-Wulf Condor. The contributions made by Coastal Command were, were very significant, but its losses were also very great. Coastal Command sank 165 German U-boats and damaged a further 107. But it also lost 741 aircraft on anti-U-boat operations alone. And a, a total of 2,060 aircraft were lost on, on all Coastal Command operations. The total Coastal Command casualties from, from combat and flying accidents were about 8,874 aircrew and ground crew killed. But equally, between 1939 and 1945, a total of 784 U-boats were destroyed by aircraft, ships, mines, accidents, air bombing and so on. Again, a, a very high loss of life. So that is a, a very brief overview of ASV radar in, in the Second World War, uh, Battle of the Atlantic. And I will leave it there and very happy to take questions uh, from the audience.